The God of miracles. The God of miracles. What a series to be headed into the end of this year, the beginning of a new year. He's still the God of miracles. Miracles are why I'm here. Twelve years old, I had leukemia. Dr. Barnes, our medical doctor, told my mother on a Saturday morning, Coy's going to die. He won't last but a couple of more weeks. He's dying with the leukemia. There is no medical help for him. Just try to keep him comfortable. I was 12 years old. I was sitting in the doctor's office when Dr. Barnes told that to my mother. We got up. She shook his hand. I shook his hand. We walked out to get in our 49 Plymouth. Some of y'all don't know what that looked like. You don't need to know what it looked like. When we got in the car, my mother turned to me before she ever started the car, and she said, Coy, forget what Dr. Barnes said. There is a word that overrides every medical report, that he is still the healer. So I'm here today because he's a God of miracles. He's a God that does the impossible. He's a God that goes beyond science, goes beyond logic, goes beyond what man thinks, goes beyond what your relatives think. He is a God of miracles. I feel him in this house. I said, I feel the God of miracles. Is there anybody in this room that still believes in miracles? Just want to make sure I'm in the right place. This is a God moment where God wants to do unusual things. My son called. Our schedule allowed it. And he had asked many times this year. It was our busiest year forever on the road, seeing what God's doing across the nation. But when he called, something leaped inside me. And I said, this is the moment that God wants me to give a God word to this people. I'm not here to impress you. At 76 years old, I don't need to. I've done, done all the impressing I can impress about. And the most important one I ever impressed is that beautiful woman right there sitting on the front seat. You talk about miracles. I was broken. I'd gone through a divorce. Things had not gone well. I was pastoring a church in Stone Mountain that we had pioneered, and we were going along great. Things were doing great, but my heart was broken because of the situation that I'd gone through and the opinions of people. You don't have to shut me down. I'll preach it anyway. The opinions of people can stop what God wants to do in your life. Don't allow the opinions of people. I'm going to be talking in a few moments from 1 Samuel 17 if I can get to it. But don't allow the opinions of people. Because the first thing that happened when David got to the battlefield was the opinions of people. Some people are going to reject you. Some people are going to say nasty stuff about you. Some people are not going to understand where you're from. But I'm going to tell you there is a God. That still moves and picks us up, turns us around, makes good things happen in our lives. I don't have any sad news today. If you come for sad news, you're in the wrong seat. I believe he's still the miracle God. I still believe whatever the doctor says, God can reverse it. Amen? My mother and dad told me that Saturday night after Dr. Barnes on a Sunday morning, Coy's going to die, but my dad looked at me at a third grade education, but he looked at me and had an old Bible, I've still got it, raggedy, marked all up, and he said to me, son, this Bible says in the morning, God is going to heal you. 
We're going to take you to a Bible-believing church that believes in the power of prayer. I can just tell you that's what EP is. That's what EP was founded on. He's still a miracle-working God. I said he is still a miracle-working God. He can help you wherever you're at. And so I didn't sleep much that night. I got up, fed the horse, took care of that business, got back in the house, got dressed. Not a person was moving. I finally went to the bedroom door. My mom and dad knocked on the door and said, Hey, they said, What? I said, It's Sunday morning. They said, my God, it's 6 o'clock. I said, but it's Sunday morning. It's my miracle day. Can somebody hear me in the house? This is your miracle day. No matter what you're facing, it's your miracle day. They took me to church. I'll not belabor the story. After the preacher preached, you know how preachers are. Sometimes they preach and they preach and they re-preach what they just preached and they Ah, y'all act like y'all been around. And they re-preach. And finally, I'm thinking, will he shut up? I come to get my miracle. I hope somebody in this house today starts saying, will Coy hush up? I come to get my miracle. God has something special he wants to do in your life. Finally, he did quit, gave an altar call. There's 40 of us there. Gave an altar call for sinners. I looked around. I said, I know every one of these people. And he gave an altar call again for sinners. I thought, Pastor, Pastor, I know every one of these people. They're Christians. I'm ready for my miracle. I got up this morning at about 5.15. I was ready for church. Y'all don't may not understand that. But when the sun comes up on Sunday morning, for over 50 years, I've been taking a microphone, talking to somebody in the world about Jesus. And I want to tell you today, I got excited, something boiling inside me, said this is a day of miracles. He's still the God of miracles. He can still turn a disadvantage into an advantage. He can take a, a mess and make a miracle out of it. And when it come time, I rushed to the altar. The saints gathered around. Somebody touched God for me. I'm still here, healed by the power of God. Now, I walked inside a church in Florida to preach for my friend from Oklahoma, and uh, I walked in that Sunday night, had preached in Stone Mountain that morning, was not thinking about a woman. Been divorced for five and a half years, was not thinking about a woman. I was thinking I was headed in there to preach, but God had a divine appointment. <laughs> oh, hot dog Jesus. God was waiting on me. I walked in that door, looked up on the platform, and I thought, oh, Jesus, who is that blonde girl up there? That time she was really blonde. Had that Florida sunshine blonde. I looked up there, walked on up to the front, slid in by, by Pastor Fred, and I said, uh, Fred, is that blonde right there married? He said, son, you're here to preach. I said, you tell me she ain't married, I'll preach the paint off the wall. He said, she ain't married. I said, one more question. He said, get your mind on having church. I said, I'm fixing to. Is she dating anybody that I'm going to have to take care of? He laughed and said, no. I said, watch out. Here comes Jesus. I looked her up. I looked her down. I looked her up. If you don't believe that, ask her. I looked her up and down, and I said, mm -hmm, I feel the Lord. I sensed the Holy Ghost all over me. 
And so y'all know the rest of the story. Soon as church was over, don't ask me what I preached. I have no idea. But I know after it's over, people were saying that's a great message, but I wasn't listening to them. I was headed on a mainline event. I walked up to her, bumped into her accidentally on purpose, and the rest is history. Glory to God. I believe in miracles. As somebody as beautiful, sweet, wonderful, anointed as she is would say yes to me, well, I still believe in miracles. And I just want to tell you all today, you're at the right place. When you came through the door of this house, when you connect to this ministry, I can testify because Dee and I preach somewhere almost every Sunday and doing a conference, all kinds of stuff, and this is a place that God resides in. When you come through those double doors, God's going to meet you here. He doesn't care what color you are. He don't care what your background is. He don't even care what you've done in the past. God's grace is sufficient, and his miracles are still able. Are you listening to me? So I want to talk to you a little bit about advantages of challenges. Anybody beside me ever have a challenge? Well, let's make it a little more real. Anybody beside me in a challenge right now? I had one yesterday. I'm believing God to solve it today. Come on, somebody. But in the story, it's a classic story. It's a story if you've gone to Sunday school, you've gone to church, you've heard this story, you know about this story of David on the battlefield, 1 Samuel 17, facing Goliath. But I want us to look. If y'all got the scripture, put it up here and let's see if they can uh, read along with us. 1 Samuel chapter 17, and I'll start at verse 32. David said to Saul, let no one lose heart on account of this Philistine. Your servant will go and fight him. Next verse. Saul replied, the king, the authority, you are not able to go out against this Philistine and fight him. You are only a young man, and he has been a warrior from his youth. Now, I want to say something to you. The first thing that happened was the king said, you can't do it. The king said, you're not able. But he was speaking out of a heart of fear. Somebody hear me. God is not the author of fear. First Samuel, Second Samuel 1, 7 said, God has not given us a spirit of fear, but of power, of love, and of a sound mind. You don't make me nervous if you talk back. You make me nervous when you don't talk back. So Saul was speaking to David out of a heart of fear. David looked at him out of a heart of trust in God. He looked at him out of a heart of experience with God, and at that moment made a statement to him that still surprises me. 17 years old, red-headed, freckle-faced shepherd boy. But God looks beyond the outward. Hello, somebody. I said God looks beyond the outward. Because a few days before that, Samuel, the prophet, had ended up at the house of David's father and said to Jesse, I have one of your sons is going to be the next king. He is going to reign over Israel. Immediately, Jesse brought his seven sons. They all prayed it before him, handsome, tall, nice-looking guys, and every time God said no. I just want to say this to you. 
Others may be in front of you, but God can get you to the open door. Others might have applied for the job ahead of you, but God's about to promote you. You see, I believe we're entering a season of prophetic fulfillment like you and I have never seen. I believe Ezekiel 12, 28, when God said we're entering a season of no more delays. Look at your neighbor and say delay is over. Anybody beside me ready for God to answer that prayer? Delay is coming to an end. At the same time, God said, I will restore to you the years that have been taken away from your life. I believe I'm entering a season of restoration. Already act like I'm 60, I'm fixing to act like I'm 50. I've told people for years, I'm going to live to 120 so I can aggravate y'all. That's my job is to pester you. Make sure that you stay on the right path. But I'm here to tell you, we're entering a season, no matter what anybody says or thinks, where God's going to do incredible things. Now, listen to me. David standing there, and for time's sake, I won't read the rest of that chapter, but David is standing there, and the first thing that I want you to make note of on your little note-taking that you do is God is positioning and preparing your life. God has been positioning, and he's been preparing you for this moment. The Bible says that David, watching over the sheep, had an encounter with a lion. Now, I get upset if it's a little poodle dog. But if it's a lion coming to get the sheep and I'm responsible, and the Bible said David stepped into that position with that lion and ripped his head off. Now, how many knows a 17-year-old boy, freckle-faced, bow-legged, red-headed, didn't do that in his own ability? He did that because an anointing of the supernatural came upon him for a purpose. Somebody's got to know God still moves in the supernatural to accomplish the purpose of God. I shouldn't be holding a microphone all of these years preaching all over the world to crowds of 50, 60,000 people because I took a zero on an oral book report in front of my senior class of 28. Because I said, I can't talk in front of people. Forget it. But I was blessed I worked at a grocery store that they, they roasted chicken and I was the delivery boy and I delivered it to my English teacher. So when Miss Moran came to the door and she looked and saw it was me, she backed up and said, please step inside. And I stepped inside and she said, please don't tell nobody I'm drunk. I said, I have a, a, a word that we need to negotiate with. I won't tell nobody you're drunk if you lose my grades from zero to A's. She never stuttered. She said, a deal. I never worried about another oral book report the rest of my senior year. And I left that English class with an A. Now, when I got to college, that's a different story. But 
God took somebody that was afraid to hold a microphone or stand up in front of anybody, and he filled me with the Holy Spirit, gave me a baptism of love, anointed me for kingdom purpose, and challenged me to take the gospel from my little town of 2,000 to the ends of the earth. Now, let me tell you, it was a little town in southwestern Oklahoma of 2,000. I don't believe there was 2,000 counting the dogs and cats. But God took me from there, sent me to the ends of the earth with a message that God is faithful. So as I stand here today, I stand here to tell you, God has prepared me to stand here and tell you he's a God of miracles. God has prepared me to stand here and tell you he will not fail you. No matter what you're facing, no matter what you're going through, the God I serve will stem from the stars of glory right down into your life and meet your need right where you're at. If that God could heal me of leukemia and I'm still healthy, he'll take care of whatever you're facing today. Nothing is too big for God. The Bible said all things are possible to him that believes. Mark 9, 23, all things, all things. Somebody say it with me, all things. All things are possible. All I've got to do is believe God. So when David stepped up on that scene and the king, the Saul, the leader, said to him, you can't take out Goliath. He's nine foot. You're a little kid. What do you think you're going to do? David spoke up not from what he looked like, not from what that looked like, because the soldiers of Israel, including his brothers, had run and hid when they heard Saul's, and, and they heard Goliath's voice, and they saw Saul running and hiding. But David stepped onto the scene and said, The God that helped me kill the lion and the God that helped me kill the bear is the God that's going to help me take out this nasty piece of humanity that is bothering God's people. I just come to tell somebody today, there's a miracle here for you. I said, there's a miracle here for you. There is a miracle in the atmosphere for you. Whatever it is, you come dragging in here saying, God, I can't handle much more. God sent me along just to say, yeah, it's going to be okay. God's going to turn it around for you. So whatever you're facing, whatever you're going through, know it's going to be all right. The second thing I want you to write down is you got to speak the promise to your giant. You got to speak the promise to your giant. Folks, I want to tell you something. May seem impossible, but I found this scripture this week. Isaiah 49 2 said, God has made your mouth like a sharp sword. God has made your mouth like a sharp sword. When David left back there talking to Saul, first of all, Saul tried to get him to put on something. He never tried before. People are always wanting you to try something that you've never had on before. But I'm here to tell you, I still believe old-time religion based on the cross of Jesus and the resurrection still works in 2021, 2022, and 2023. Some of us went through enough in 21 to kill most folks, but we're still here. Some of you have gone through some stuff in 2022 that hasn't been pleasant, but I'm here to tell you, you're going to end this year with a good note. God's going to show up in your life. God's going to show up in your life, but you got to learn to say what you 
believe in your heart. Now what's your mind saying? Now what your logic saying? What is your heart saying? And I want to tell you something. I trust God with every bit of my life. I trust him with every ounce of strength in my life. He has never failed me. There's been times it looked very bleak and dark, but I can stand here and tell you right now, I'm debt free, I'm healthy. Matter of fact, I just went to the heart doctor a couple, what, last week, week before, two weeks ago, and the heart doctor said this, the impossible has happened with your heart. Your heart, because you have AFib and you've had it since you're in your 30s, gets weaker and weaker and weaker because it's overworking. But something has reversed in your life. Your heart's getting stronger and stronger. And I wish I had some help in here. You see, God can do what medical science says is impossible. And I got news from you, I'll never die from a heart problem. I got that word from God. People are always concern my about, don't worry about my heart. You, you pray about other things, but my heart, when you hear I'm gone to heaven, it won't be because of my heart messing up. Because my heart's getting stronger and stronger. I want to tell somebody, you're about to walk into a miracle that you're not even expecting. You're about to be blessed by a miracle. You're not even knows coming your way. Somebody in this room, God, I feel the Holy Ghost is about to be overtaken by a supernatural that you prayed about a long time ago, but God is about to send it straight to your door house, and he's going to bring you a miracle right into your living room. I'm, maybe it's at home I'm talking to you. God's got a miracle for you. All I know is I'm here by divine appointment, by divine schedule, not my son's schedule, not your schedule, and not my schedule. God's schedule this day as a divine appointment for your life. And I'm here to tell you, everything's going to be okay. When David went out facing the giant, he never said, oh, he's a big boy. He never even said anything about his stature or he was a trained soldier. That's what Saul said. David walked out there saying, the God that I serve is the same God that helped me kill the lion and helped me kill the bear. I got news for every one of you. And I'm from the country. We said it in the country like this, the devil is a liar. I said the devil is a liar. He's told you you're not going to make it. He's told you you're going to go under. He's told you all kinds of lies. I come to mess with him today. I'm going to tell you God's a keeper of the promise. I said God is the promise keeper, and he's going to keep his promise to you. I don't care how your head's been lying, all the junk that's been going on, the sleepless nights. This is a day of change. Glory to God. The last Sunday of November 2022 is a Sunday of change. God said he's going to turn it around, and he's going to turn it around. God said he's going to fix it for you, and he's going to fix it for you. David's walking out there saying he's the covenant-keeping God. Psalm 89, 34 said, God will not break covenant with his people. Can I tell you, God's not going to break covenant with you. He'll be your faithful supplier. He'll be your resource. He'll be your healer. He's not going to break his covenant with you. The third thing, and I'm out of your way, you'll beat the odds. Somebody say, I'm going to beat the odds. And then we'll forget Huntsville, right outside of Huntsville, a little town called Hartsville, Alabama. I think of it so often when people ask me to pray for them. Dee and I, two weeks ago, a little over, was in a 
preaching, ministering, singing in a conference in Lexington, Kentucky. A lady with stage four cancer walked through the healing line where Dee and I was ministering. We laid hands on that little senior adult. The power of God shook that senior adult like I know is the power of God. Went all the way through her, shaking her. She come back the next morning. That was a Friday night. Dee and I had ministered. Came back Saturday morning. We were ministering again. She walked through the line. But before she got to the line, she run ahead of everybody. Y'all know when you're excited? She forgot protocol. Say, excuse me, please. Excuse me, please. Get out of my way. I got a word to tell Coen D. Barker. She come running up there and she said, I just got to tell y'all, last night I slept eight hours, the first time in two years. I have no pain in this cancer-ridden body because last night Jesus healed me. I wish I had some believers in the room. He's still a God of miracles. In Alabama, they brought Letha Harris. She weighed 78 pounds. They brought her in an ambulance on a stretcher. Doctors at the University of Hospital in Birmingham sent her home to die. Told her daughter, said she may last seven days, she may last ten, but she, it's over. And I had said in the night before in the meeting, birthing that church, I said, Get people here tomorrow night if you have to get them here in an ambulance. Buy a one-way ticket. And so when I drove up to the getting close to the storefront building for the church, there was no parking spaces. And you know, there's supposed to be signs out there that says, for the most high reverend. <laughs> Lighten up, folks. So I drove up close, had to drive around the block of Hartzell, drove back down about two blocks before I could find a place to park. Got my Bible, saw that ambulance sitting in front of the building, and thought, Jesus, I sure hope you said that, not me. I walked into that building. They were trying to have song service. Nobody was looking at the leader or singing. They was looking at that piece of flesh on that stretcher with those two paramedics and that daughter. I stepped up there and said, Jim, hold, hold it just a minute. I walked back there to that stretcher. How many knows he's a God of miracles? I said, how many knows he's a God of miracles? See, you come too late to tell me he's not a God of miracles. So I walked back to the stretcher, long story short. I said, I can't pray with, for her with that oxygen tent and all that junk on her, oxygen up her nose, stuff in her veins. Take all that stuff out. The paramedic's eyes were as big as silver dollars. One of them said, sir, if you do that, she'll die. I said, well, the doctor said she's going to die anyway. So take your stuff off of her. They looked to the daughter. The daughter stuck her head under that oxygen tent and said, Mama, Pastor Barker wants to know, can he take all this stuff off you? In a weak, frail voice, Letha said, yes, yes, yes. They started taking it off of her. I reached over to her and I said, Letha, you have an appointment with God. Not this country preacher. You have an appointment with God. God's fixing to make you whole. God's fixing to raise you up off this stretcher. God's fixing to drive cancer and death out of your body. He's still the mighty God. I picked her up in my arms and set her up, and her ace face was ashen white, gray, the smell of death. I let go of her, and she fell back on the stretcher. I said, oh, no, honey, we got to get up. I said, this time, I'm going to pick you up and stand you up. 
I picked her up in the name of Jesus. And as I was standing her up, I said, Letha, you shall live and not die. In the name of Jesus Christ, be made whole. Cancer, leave her body. Instantly, her face turned rosy pink. She said, ooh, I'm feeling something. Her voice began to get strong. She said, Pastor, I'm feeling something. I said, I'm fixing to let go of you. When I let go, you take off. I let go of her. The power of God ran through Letha. She went out one side, walked around, came all the way back by, waved at me, and took another loop. She come back by the second time. She said, man, I'm feeling really good. God healed that woman. Three months later, I was in Huntsville, Alabama, at a big fancy church, hundreds of people there. In those days, they had you sit on the platform. Pastor said, we're going to have fellowship time. And everybody's going to mingle and shake hands. You know how they used to do that? They don't do it much anymore, but they used to have fellowship time. And So I'm sitting up here on the platform. Everybody's fellowshipping. All of a sudden, this woman starts down this middle aisle. You know that you know when she's headed it, you know she's coming after you. I'm looking at her. I said, I don't know her. Surely she won't come up on this platform, break all protocol. She came right up on that platform. I stood up to shake her hand. She picked me up, whirled me around. I'm saying, woman, put me down. Set me down. She said, you don't know who I am, do you? I said, no, ma'am, I sure don't. She said, I'm Letha Harris. I said, oh, my God. I said, last time I saw you, you weighed 78 pounds. I said, you need, well, anyway. God said, I'm a faithful God. I'm a God of miracles. I still beat the odds when everybody says, there is no way. 